Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Gary Mayloff. I'm, I'm an architect for a company named Media Crossing that does digital media trading, and we're based out of Stanford, Connecticut. And today I'm here to talk to you about getting your first Spark deployment productionized and ready to go. Um, I know many previous talks yesterday and today have been about working on coming in on existing Hadoop systems and bringing Spark in. Uh, my company was a very unique case. We, we incorporated late 2012, and we had the ability to start from the beginning with Spark. And I think there's some interesting decision points for people who are going through that. Uh, just to be clear, as I mentioned with my target audience, uh, one of the first things you should be doing, and I don't hear this mentioned enough, make sure you actually have big data. A lot of people grab Spark or Hadoop or whatever because it sounds cool. Just sanity check yourself. Make sure you're actually going to be working with big data, please. There's better tools for smaller data, I promise. Um, the other thing, obviously, make sure it's a new installment, as I mentioned. And of course, as I said, this tar is targeted at people where it's their first time using it. Um, just a brief thing about media crossing. As I said, we are digital media traders, which means we buy and sell ads in real time on behalf of advertisers and publishers. In addition, we're, try we're trying to act as a market maker for the industry, as in modeling as a, an ad impression more like it's a, a stock, a short-term future. And there's some very unique challenges with that, and this is why we use Spark. Um, so again, we as I said, we started trading in the beginning of 2013, so we were able to start with Spark, Spark from the beginning, no MapReduce. Um, so what the first thing we had to think about was, you know, we need real-time feedback. And so we, you know, I was, I'm a big fan of Nathan Mars' Lambda architecture, and I decided, I was looking at, you know, how can I process stuff? Sure. Better? Okay. And I'm a big fan of Nathan Mars's Lambda architecture, and I was just looking for what's the best way to combine my hi historic data and real-time data. Um, you know, if you're being, if you're doing trading, you really need to know how much, how much ads you've bought or sold. You know, what is your risk in the market? And we were, we thought Spark was a critical component for this. Um, so when you're first starting out fresh, the first thing you have to decide is where will your data be stored. Um, you've seen talks over the last two days. You know. The two big boys, obviously, are HDFS and Cassandra. Um, again, we went with HDFS for our small data, uh, as in the, the incoming streaming data. Uh, and one of the things when you go with HDFS is you have to make sure that Spark compiles against the right version, especially if, for example, we needed MapReduce 1 for something. I'll talk about that in a little bit. And so we actually ended up having to compile. We, each time when Spark gets a new release, we've had to compile our own version. Hopefully, with 1.0, we won't have to anymore, but just something to keep in mind. I'm sorry? We still need to compile. <laughs> I'm hoping not, but we'll see what happens. <laughs> um, and then the next thing you hear a lot, you know, the last two talks obviously were about yarn, and that's all well and good. Um, you, you, still have to, you, have, you still have a choice, especially when you don't have Hadoop yet. Um, so we evaluated the three. Standalone w looks interesting, and if honestly, if our platform was just focused on analytics, we probably would have went with Spark standalone. Um, we looked at yarn. Uh, we were a little hesitant to get ourselves tied too deeply into the Hadoop infrastructure, especially when we were starting fresh. And so we ended up going with Mesos, um, largely because we prefer a lot of the things in the Berkeley stack, and we think that plays very nicely with it. We felt Mesos was a bit more generic and much simpler for us to work with. Um, you know, right after that, we have basically we have two types of data to deal with at Media Crossing, and I'm sure many others do as well. You have your streaming data. You know, what options do you have for that? Uh, you obviously have Spark Streaming. Uh, Apache Flume is what we ended up using, well, mostly because we, we had worked with Spark. I was less familiar with Spark Streaming. Uh, I'm very happy with Flume. Uh, we actually, it's actually a Apache Storm with Flume feeding the data. But anyway, that's what we're doing on the streaming side. And for our large batches, we, we drop the data on, into a file system and just use Spark Jobs to load it in and format it the way we want it. Um, and then the last thing you have to ask yourself is you really need reliable job scheduling. Uh, in open source world, you know, for, I know many people probably just use cron jobs with your Hadoop MapReduce things. Uh, we went with Kronos since we had Mesos. Nice tool to leverage. We found it very easy to use. The developers were very responsive. So just some of the things you want to think about there. Uh, very briefly, uh, I just wanted to touch on how, I, we, how our worker nodes are formulated because I think this is important. Uh, we run it, we co-locate our Mesos slaves with our HDFS data nodes. This, you'll want this, it's a performance concern. I, I, I've tried it both ways, not fun, if you don't, if you don't do this. And as a result, if your Meso, where your Mesos slaves are is where your Spark workers will end up running. 
Um, we do have MapReduce v1 there, but it's only because of a single file crush job, which I'll cover on my next slide. Uh, and then just something to note, we have, when our Spark workers do two different things, they can, when we take our small data and go to roll it up, we, we do two things. We can write it to HDFS if we have more uses for it. Uh, more often than not, though, we're really writing our aggregates to Cassandra. We found Cassandra as a better option than, H, than HBase, which I've used in the past. And we're really not tied to the Hadoop platform because we're new. And I don't, honestly, I don't want to be. <laughs> it's just, you know, if you're starting in 2013, 2014, try to go pure Spark. I really encourage it. Uh, storing your data, you basically, uh, when you're using HDFS, you have two options. A lot of people use text files, so they can throw JSON in there. I mean, we saw some cool JSON presentations earlier. Um, the downside, they're not so easy to compress. Keep that in mind. Uh, we actually go with sequence files. Uh, the large part is because we use protobuf messages throughout our system. We find it of a nice backwards compatible format. And so we, sequence files is where we went with. Obviously, they're not human readable, so you have to be aware of that and be able to deal with it appropriately. So when you're first starting out, sometimes you'll get going and you'll realize that my Spark cluster is performing terribly. Um, this is definitely what we ran into at the very beginning. Before, we, before our data had gotten to the appropriate size, it was about a, maybe a, a month or so. And what ended up happening was we had forgotten about HDFS's default block size and the effects that it has. Spark does have a repartition function to deal with this. I wasn't aware of it at the time, to be honest with you. It took me some research to figure it out. But we definitely suffered, and we're in EC2, so we were blaming EC2. We were just throwing patches at all kinds of things. And it, and it turned out to be that we just needed to roll our files up. Um, we, were we were rolling logs hourly, but we hadn't aggregated them into larger files. Uh, you can write a job on Spark to do this. Uh, you, can, you can batch it in when you first import data, obviously. We used File Crush, which is why we have MapReduce 1. And it's the only reason, honestly, we have MapReduce 1. But I believe we're actually working on something similar for Spark that will open source very soon. A couple other obvious things for you ops people, like automate your configuration deployment from day one. It, may, it will make your life so much easier, especially when you want to upgrade Spark on your own. Um, you know, having this in, on, on, we use Ansible. Puppet and Chef will work just as well. You know, that's a matter of personal taste, really. Uh, but the important thing is when, you're, when it's automated and it's version controlled, you, it's very, it makes it very easy to upgrade, roll back, and figure out your diffs as you go along. Just, this, this might seem obvious, maybe not to some people, but do it. You'll be very happy you did it from the beginning. Um, as I mentioned earlier, co-locate your Spark workers with your HDFS data nodes if you really want to get the best possible performance. We notice a significant boost with this. And then in an ideal world, you have two types of jobs running. You, you might have your scheduled jobs that are running hourly, every 20 minutes, whatever, whatever you're doing with Spark. And then you separately have a bunch of people running ad hoc queries. And I don't know how many about you, but this is my second, this is my second company with some kind of distributed system. And there's always that person in analytics that runs the massive job that takes the whole cluster down, uh, right? <laughs> Separate your cluster if you can afford it. You know, once you get to a certain size, it's much more achievable. There's plenty of tools to replicate your data across. Um, we're, we're actually, we haven't done it ourselves yet. However, we haven't run into this. We're, we're planning to do it. And, I highly encourage everyone else to keep that in mind. Monitoring, again, Spark covers this extensively in their own documentation, so I'm not going to harp on every little detail. But in practice, we use Nagios the most. It's old, old school, but it works just the same. It tells us when stuff broke. Thank you. And we use Munin for diagnosing longer running problems with Mesos or, oh, it's, it's time to expand our cluster because we're, we're spinning the CPUs too much. And then finally, we don't get to use the Spark UI, which is, which is, again, very nice UI. It's just when you run Mesos, you have to use the Mesos one. And that's actually pretty, I, I just watch that different times of the day. And I can pretty quickly find out when it's time to add more nodes to the cluster. Uh, just a list of analytics tools. This has been covered a lot in previous slides. But um, PySpark, you know, a, a lot of analytics teams are really not Scala aficionados yet. So, Python is a great way for them to get, to get them going. You know, eventually you'll get them in the Spark shell in Scala, but you know, start off slow. Spark R is very interesting. Uh, we're not allowed to use it ourselves, only be, not allowed, but we're not able to use it ourselves because Spark R doesn't support sequence files yet. Um, I believe I saw a mailing list post though where that'll be in there very soon. Uh, very excited about Spark CQL. We're actually planning to install this in the next week or two for our own analytics team. Uh, I was really happy with the presentations I saw. 
Um, we tried out Shark earlier. We actually ripped it out just because we felt it was too much complexity. And honestly, something like 90% of the time we were using the Spark shell anyway. And we just we said no thank you. Um, and then MLlib and GraphX are obviously things you've heard in other talks. But Jill, these are some of the tools that are in there that you should keep in mind. Uh, that's it. That's about it. I just I hope this is a good handbook for people who are just getting started with Spark. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. And thank you for listening. Uh, you're you're way in the back. You had your hand up first. I'm sorry. I couldn't hear the HDFS versus what. Sure, I'm happy to. Um, the reason, on, regarding S3, the reason we run, in, just so everyone knows, we run in Amazon today, but we don't want, honestly, we don't want to be married or stuck to it. So we've avoided using any of their services. We just, everything's ansibleized, as we call it, which is, it's, you know, it can be automatically deployed. So whether it's on EC2 servers or dedicated hardware, we're able to switch quickly. That's mostly why we avoid S3 at this point. Um, and then I, the, regarding the original question, which was HDFS versus Cassandra, um, it has been my experience that the really small, for really small data, I still think that HDFS is the way to go. I, I prefer it over Cassandra. Uh, that's, just, that's just my own experience. I, other people have had different ones. Having said that, when I'm dealing with key value data, I, I really want to use Cassandra. I think its high availability is awesome, and that's the data that we're querying from our, our different web, web services in order to show data in our UI. So when we do our roll-ups, we really want it in Cassandra, and that's how we generate reports, generate real-time stats, and a lot of other things like that. Yes, sir. Sure. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're using Kronos at the moment. Um, I believe Aurora recently is, is out of Twitter, if I'm not mistaken, and it looks like it kind of duplicates Kronos' stuff. We, I just, we just ha honestly haven't had time to work with it. Um, Marathon, we've talked a lot about, and we just haven't had the the bandwidth, we're very, we're, you know, we're a 10 engineer team at this point. We just haven't had the bandwidth yet to get it going, but Mar Marathon excited us a lot. And that's one of our reasons for choosing Mesos, honestly. Maybe one more question. Sh sure. Um, I think you had your hand up first. Yes, but you, again, if you don't have all of that automated yet, and sometimes you don't if you, you know, yes, we happen to run on EC2, but there's plenty of people that run on dedicated that hardware servers don't necessarily spin up automatically. Um, so we like to keep, we like to know how much we're spending. Uh, we don't, we don't want to double our costs overnight because someone ran a crazy job. So I'm still of the, again, we haven't done it yet, but we're, we're working on it. But I'm still of the opinion that your research cluster should be separated. You just don't want your more important, to me, the schedule jobs are the number one priority and the research is, is very important, but you don't want it taking down your production jobs that could cost you money. Thank you very much, okay, guys. Let's thank the speaker again. Nice talk. Thank you. Okay, hey, thanks everyone. So we have a 30 minute break now, and then the last session of the conference is uh, at five. Thank you. <laughs>